as we cover many an insane movie and numerous cult TV phenomenon. Are you ready to get jacked up? Are you with us? Then listen on. Welcoming to the show, we got David German. How are you? Hey, how you doing? Always good, always good. Jonathan Mark of the Action Elite. Hello. <laughs> Hello there, son of more. Uh, <laughs> and Daniel Ryan, also known as the Nightmare Nerd. Greetings, horror fanatics. <laughs> All right, so here for another spooky... <laughs> John Woo on Tex-Mex style showdown. That is the career of Robert Rodriguez. How did you, uh, circling around, Daniel, how did you come across this guy? Was it just his collaborations with Tarantino or was it just in general? Just you heard about him? Um, I'll be honest, it was mostly the collaborations with Tarantino. Oh, good. You know, um, like, Ryan House really thrust him into my... Uh, my consciousness. But from there, I began to research him and found that, eh, he's done some stuff I like. Right. Johnny, how about you? <laughs> well, for me, it was Desperado. That's what introduced me to Robert Rodriguez. It was on TBS every fucking weekend. <laughs> Pretty much, you know. <laughs> it really was. People forget when that was a thing. Dinner in a movie. <laughs> yep. Bandera, Salma Hayek, Slow Motion, A Guitar. That's also a machine gun that's also, you know, carrying a bunch of hidden weapons that's, you know, various mobsters. Total tribute to the man with no name, the Clint Eastwood, Sergio Leone, Spaghetti Western trilogy. <laughs> oh, yeah, most definitely. And, uh, David, how did you come across Mr. Rodriguez? Well, I think, I think, I think uh, El Mariachi was sort of in my periphery. I, I'd never seen it, but I remember reading about it. And then Desperado, but I think the first one I saw was from Dust Till Dawn. And then I went back and, and discovered uh, El Mariachi and uh, Desperado after I had seen from Dust Till Dawn. Yeah, but you know, I'm yeah, I'm a little. I think I'm older than probably everybody here. So I remember oh, when oh, um, El Mariachi came out. And it was in, I remember reading a lot about this movie and you know how crazy it was and this new director coming up. I mean, it was only his third feature, I think. Yeah, he always has had you know non. Uh, directors guild crews you know just total you know contractors uh, I've heard many people talk about how just they'd be up till get going on even just two hours of sleep on his crews just shooting yeah over. yeah and I have to say though the one, the El Mariachi the, um, the movie I, I couldn't stop thinking about um, Bugsy Malone does anybody know this movie this, yeah, this, was Scott yeah, Bayo. Because of the the, the, the guitar cases with the uh, marshmallow Jody guns. Jody Foster it, in that. Yeah, Jody Foster. Yeah, that, that's a that's a weird movie. But I, I did, my mind kept going back to that because of the guitar cases, which sure which tickled me, which tickled their, me no end. Uh, I'm sure he and Tarantino had their laser disc of it. <laughs> that's actually it's, it's must you know if you're a cinephile, uh, cinephile that's a must watch. I think it's hmm. so it's so weird. Yeah, years before we were seeing other goofy stuff like Dick Tracy and other stuff. Like... And, and it was nice to see Scott Bayo getting work back then. I don't know if he gets much work now. <laughs> you know, anyway. Before he was being weird and playing himself on Arrested Development. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so I can't, 
I'll just say this. I went and saw every Spy Kids in the theater except the fourth one. Thank God I didn't see the fourth one in the theater. That would have been bad. But and then in college, you know, I saw, uh, you know, uh, TBS again would show Once Upon a Time in Mexico and Despero endlessly. Uh, Spanish Channel would also show El Mariachi on occasion. They even made a Telemundo of it for one season. Not didn't look all that good from what I saw. Uh, from just still done. Uh, yeah, I, I got into that in college. Uh, the sequels were always on Sci-Fi Channel and very rarely on FX or TNT when they showed the original. And yeah. I'm, I'm told that from one article that detailed movies that are edited for TV that the alternate slogans they use for all the names and the it's like the titty twister or whatever is like they're, they're so stupid sounding. It's like it's like just keep it in. That's like the least offensive out of all the things in the movie. But um. <laughs> Yeah, it, you know, and it definitely from Dustal Dawn definitely had to be the one where it's like, this is a great role. Who'd have thought? And, you know, George Clooney, <laughs> super TV star at the time, Tarantino co-starring as another nutty version of himself. Well, Clooney, Clooney did get his start in Attack on Kill Tomatoes. Yeah, he, did. No, he sure did. And yeah. I still know this. I could still sing you the song from that oh, movie. Oh, God. The theme song. I won't do it here, but I, I it still, it's, in my, it's in my head right now. Oh Jesus Christ! I know. Uh, imagine it. I wonder if someone went on YouTube and just synced up that soundtrack over scenes from Dustal Dawn. That'd be a pretty nutty rescore. You know how they do the uh, like when Salma when Salma comes out and starts dancing, they just start playing uh, that. Uh, uh, that. Yeah, that'd be pretty. Actually, I'm thinking of. Actually, I'm, thinking of I'm, get, I'm, I'm getting turned on just thinking about it. Actually, uh, I uh, no boner for me there. Sorry. I, um, I, no, I normally will not objectify. I gotta admit, Salma. Oh boy, in that movie. Oh no, yeah, Salma. <laughs> oh, to be an albino she python. She knew. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. But um, I can, I, I'll never forgive him for uh, Shark Boy versus Lava Girl. Oh, oh I don't think. My, my, my daughter, my daughter was uh, like the right age for that. Like when it came out, she was. I don't know what year was that. It was I 05 it and oh five, so that's racing all the other free. So, fifth, so she was seven. My daughter was seven, so she was right in that movie's wheelhouse. And like even she, like after a half an hour, turned to me, is like, "What is this piece of shit?" You know, like, I, I don't know. know you want to watch it? <laughs> want, want to hear a good one? Sure. There's actually a professional what wrestler, guess, Shark whatever. Boy. No, why? He, really? He, he wow. sued, I'm back. He sued Disney. Because he had the copyright to Shark Boy back in the nineties. Oh, that's right. They're still. And, and he got film. a damn good settlement out of them. Uh, it's <sighs> very rarely even on TV. Like the only person who seems wow. to show it is Free Ford. And they're making stuff. a they're making a sequel. I know, and oh, no, uh, they are not. No, I heard there is. I don't know who's. Oh, I don't know who's making it or why, but there is going to be a Shark Boy. Oh, it's Rodriguez, Girl 2 or whatever. But. Uh, I heard a rumor that even his he made it for his kids and his kids fucking hated it. Is that any truth to that? Well, he made it for his kids. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, uh, I, it, sure it was, it was like from a story that his kids wrote. I think his kids wrote the original story. And he's like, uh, I'll adapt this into a screenplay. Sure. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Boy. Yeah, that's an ego trip. So I guess what do we like and hate about him? Because I, I think what's cool about him is that he, again, he hosted the director's chair on his El Rey cable network. He had the very inspiring book called Rebel Without a Crew about his time in film school from, you know, UT Austin. And then, you know, he clearly loves movies. And yet at the same time that we have seen some of his misfires where it's like, this is just too much is like, like Grindhouse. I know many people like it. I cannot get into it, even though there's moments is like, I, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, I've tried getting to lead a battle angel, and I know many people swear by that one. I was just like, this. Yeah, I've, oh, no, I've, no. I've tried watching it twice now, and I cannot. I mean, it's not bad, but I just. The, can't the effects are it. good. Yeah, and I like the cast and everything, but it's as one of those. So, like, as someone who likes the manga, it's based on that movie is Shion. What's weird is my friend Tony, who is all into manga and anime, he didn't want to see it. He just like had no trust for the material and everything. I'm like, that's weird. He usually sees he's anything. Cyberpunk, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, something you need to attain. <laughs> no, it's all good. I mean, uh, uh, the main gal, I think she's going to keep being a, a big star, and I, I know oh, yeah. they're working on yeah. a sequel, and so I don't oh, know. All I kept thinking 
because I wanted to go back and watch Rollerball with James Caan while I'm watching. It's like I'd rather watch that, you know. So there was such a, those the battles, you know, the sport battle scenes were so much evocative of Rollerball. I think I'm showing my age here when I when I no, I, I know what you mean. That was like one of the earliest <laughs> cyberpunk movies, Fight to the Death, years before uh, we were. Great movie, fucking great movie. <laughs> I'm like the only person on the planet who likes the remake, and that was after. Oh years my god! This. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. <laughs> I still get to see the remake, so don't. don't. Yes, please. Don't. I'd, I'd rather have my teeth cleaned than I, watch I, it again. I was just, I, it, it was just so goofy. By my dentist. Especially because John Victor is just literally just copying every frame of all his other movies, like <laughs> Predator and Die Hard. Yeah. Not oh, good. not good. Oh dear. So. I think that's just it. It's like I've seen Rodriguez be labeled, you know, awesome, you know, surreal, so bad he's good, delightfully trashy. I think he's intentionally trashy, and yet at the same time, yeah. you know, it depends. Sure. It depends on the movie, like which one went too far, which one is good, and which one, like, well, well so let yeah, let, let's start off with from Dust Till Dawn because that's kind of the one that. We all kind of just would see because you know right. Tino rewrote a story mm -hmm. by special effects wizard Robert Kurtzman of Wishmaster fame, and then you know Rodriguez adapted it and was influenced by in interviews, including one translated from Spanish, like movies like Die Hard and A Soul on Precinct Thirteen, and it's just having this out of control. And despite the trailer literally giving everything away, yes, back in '96, even that was a thing. Most of us did not know, you know, what to expect. We heard it was a vampire movie, but we would often forget because it starts off first half as a road trip movie, you know, family taken hostage, you know, killers on the road. And yeah, I think what's so cool is much like the heist in Reservoir Dogs, you you have this whole impression in your head. You know, you got Kelly Preston in a cameo as a reporter saying, you know, all these men slaughtered by these two, you know, escape brother inmates and just you have that all painted for you they just hijacked a bus or who knows what and so you already know that what they're capable of you got a then unknown john hawks as the uh you know store clerk being set on fire it, it's just already getting you in the mood for just an over-the-top trip that it is and cheech uh and cheech marin yeah and two different roles is like geez maybe free if you count his mutant self but yeah it's like wow it's like who have yeah. thought um, mm -hmm. so, uh, how does it compare? I mean, obviously it is part of the whole Tarantino universe also. So it's interesting how, you know, this is where pretty much the main connection, um, and especially seeing the deputies, which are played by real life, you know, father and son, Michael and James Parks, and they later appear in the Kill Bill films. And so uh, it's interesting how. They're basically the Looney Tunes of the show, as I mentioned before, where it's like they keep dying and then coming back to life in some other installment. There's no prerequisite or direct timeline to this whole affair. <laughs> um, um, you know, th this, I think, rates as a modern vampire classic because it does reimagine the vampire mythos a bit, introduce new elements, and just it's fun. It's just plain fun, like Lost Boys or Vamp. Yeah, there's even some references to Lost Boys that totally oh, flew yeah. over my hand, but at first, but yeah, um, and and what, what's interesting is kind of how how do we rank Tarantino as an actor? I know some people can't stand him, and other people like him. I think oh, in his own a, stuff, he, he's mindlessly self-indulgent. He's a terrible actor. No, that's fine. I mean. I can stand him in Pulp Fiction, but I can't stand him and say Destiny Turns on the Radio or that one Muppet special. Is so I, it definitely depends. <laughs> that, that that scene of sticking her foot in his mouth, you know, that, all yeah. his decision. Apparently, he was. <laughs> they still the New York Friars Club is still a thing, and apparently they held held a roast for him that was hosted by Sam Jackson and Uma Thurman. Made sure to roast him, saying, "I hope oh, you enjoy fine. every." that touch of that foot upside your ass or some shit like that it's like damn <laughs> roast a muma um yeah i i can't stand him as a person but i can't deny his fun as a movie filmmaker so it's definitely one of those things it's like okay 
Uh, so on that note, may I add in that uh, this movie, you can tell his influence because they do that whole 180 where it starts out like a road movie. Then yeah. The Apocalypse Vampire. Grindhouse driving feature. He saw opening day a multiple yeah, you times. Get whip, you get whiplash from the direction change. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Arbery Keitel is perfect as the priest, and I fucking hate it each time he dies. It's just one of those, it's like, <laughs> no. <laughs> I agree with that. And it's like, and just yeah, the he's way a national it's framed treasure. With, with no, no cutaways. I'm like, fuck you, filmmaker, for killing him. No, 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 no. <laughs> He's the one holding this thing mostly together. He's this movie one. is a this movie is a good litmus test. You show it to somebody who's never seen it, and depending on which half of it they like better, you immediately know what kind of person they are. Right? Yeah. Uh, that's why. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, and uh, I actually got to see uh, the band that performs in this with Rodriguez and his band uh, Los Lobos at a local uh, uh, square here in Dallas, te- in, in Grand Prairie, Texas, and and so it was just so wild. My 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 friend Paul, who's a family friend of my father's, you know, totally knew what they were from. And my parents is like, they never seen that, you know. <laughs> so it was like they don't do well, vampire movies. <laughs> when I was in uh, when I when I was in the Air Force, I was stationed in Austin. So uh, nice. you know, Los Lobos Los Lobos was uh, a big deal even even back then. Or uh, that's they... how music. Yeah. So uh, so I, I I dug that. Uh, just because of that, that part of my I'm life. Sorry, they I'm, were playing I'm for hours in that, place. Uh, that, that, that gang from Short Circuit 2. <laughs> oh, Short really? Circuit. Oh, my God. They, they they named that, was it named after the band? Was the band, was the, the band Shirley was oh, a wow. thing at that time. So, man, okay. Hmm. Damn. <laughs> yeah, Los Lobos and the Fabulous Thunderbirds. When I was living in Austin, it was all about Los oh, Lobos and the Fabulous yeah. T-Birds. Yeah, remember Stevie them? Stevie Ray he is missed. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, uh, the band really does almost make this a semi-musical at times. I know it's just because they're just playing during the whole outrageous, violent scenes. And it's kind <laughs> yeah, of a right. sad thing. You guys are all, you know, B-movie, seen every kind of thing that flies at you that you're interested in. I, I've had to tell even the biggest cosplayer, who the hell, Fred Williamson. They're like, oh, I don't know who that is. I'm like, oh, first, off, first off, your parents suck. No. Second off, <laughs> you've seen From Dust Till Dawn? Yeah. Remember the one guy, the bar patron, who's like, let's kick some ass, you know, chomping a cigarette? That's fucking Fred Williamson. And they still goes over their head. It's like, really? I mean, he also gets one of the more memorable mutant, you know, transformations. Yeah. Freaking Fred. Uh, this is actually the movie introduced me to him. Yeah, I think it was my second or third movie I saw him in. He's he's been in plenty of others that I forgot he was in because you know he'd be a voice or supporting role with other B movie albums. Um, I just love those um, weird Italian post apocalyptic like Mad Max ripoffs that he was in. He was like in oh, all yeah. of those. He was Absolutely. so great with the weird body armor and like some thin little headband thing going on, like. Like Olivia Newton John from Let's Get Physical. It was just so great. I just loved him in those shit. Yeah. And the, and yeah the, exactly. The mystery science theater classic that is Warrior of the Lost World. Oh my and god, just, he's I love that one so much. And, and seeing him just talk about what what was on the plot and it's like, oh, so basically none of it remained. <laughs> it's just yeah, franchise. So great. To be continued. They were doing it back then, even before all these franchise overkill. So um, I, I think what's also interesting is, uh, just how every character is introduced, and then basically as soon as they're introduced, then they instantly get to killing each time they're introduced. Is like, uh, and that's pretty much when they're realizing that this club isn't what it is supposed to be, and it's just so funny how Fred is the total vampire expert. He's breaking table chairs, saying "Stake him in the heart," and. Uh, it's so wild how Tarantino is, you know, car- sorry guys, it's been a while. I don't, uh, I, I, I know they're the Gecko brothers. I, I just remember Seth cause you know, Clooney's awesome and he owns that role. He's like one of my top 10 Tarantino characters, but this is one of those where it's just so wild. He's ready to kill. He's, and you know, Richie Tarantino's guy is just one of those is like, I'm not sure, man. You know, he's the Scooby-Doo, you know. <laughs> Shaggy equivalent, and it's like Seth is like, no, 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 hold him. You know, he's just like he's all always ready, and it's so I wild. Point, that one. 
Mm-hmm. When he first kills, how they do that weird slow motion montage. It's one of those, I don't know what the fuck they're doing there, but it's 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 great. <laughs> it's just like you're seeing it from the victim's viewpoint, and he's just flat out just shot him and stabbed him, and he's just throws away the stake as he walks away saying, Oh, ridiculous. <laughs> um so I, I also like to say that they do good on not going too overboard in all the other hostage scenes. You instantly buy that, you know, that Seth doesn't want to kill anyone unless they, again, you know, betray him or uh, it is wild how he, I guess you could say he semi is close to, ends up becoming close to the priest after a yeah, while. He is the hooker with the heart of gold in this. That's his, that's his role in this. The hooker with the heart of gold. Yeah, because the guy after a while does start preaching to him and he's like, shit, some deep stuff. <laughs> so then he, as a result, he you would have never, this is not the guy, kind of guy you want as a tag team, you know, member or to play a video game with you. He, but the, he's likely to use you as a body shield or teabag your body if he well, hates Richie, you so much. Richie does all the really heinous killing and this is Seth is trying to stop him through the first half of the movie. Right. He's trying to like reason with him. He's like yeah, he threatens him in the in the bathroom in the RV. Doesn't he like threaten to kill him if he doesn't stop? I he's think like, so. Yeah, yeah. he's he, mm-hmm. he's he's built the one with sense, but uh, and then but then it turns into the vampire thing, and then like all bets are off, you know. Right. If he wasn't his brother, he would not give a shit. He'd just shoot the son of. A yeah. Right. Man. Exactly. Yeah, and he, he tells him that. Yeah, if you want my brother. Um. And Juliette Lewis, how do we feel about her in this versus her previous role in Natural Born Killers? It. Uh, <laughs> not a fan. That's what I say. Mm. No, Actually, I, I don't mind best, in this. In this case, it's a step yeah, down. It's a step down. One. Really, you just don't feel like she has anything to do. I will. I will say this: it's wild how a lot of people of this generation seem to know her only from this. I'm like, really? She's been in a shit ton of movies. <laughs> but whatever. Well, and her well, band yeah. is pretty good. Like, She's got a really decent she, band that people don't know about. Right. Movie, but she did so much better. Fair enough. All right. Um, and a lot of people complain about the Asian, like, uh, adopted brother of theirs. And it's like, I. Yeah, I, I don't like him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's not focused on it enough to where I just don't give a shit. But I know other people are like, oh, he's fucking terrible. So I think that's the other thing. Rodriguez is not good at making sure the actors are 100%. It's just like he'll just let him play on. <laughs> well, he knows he's not making high art, that's for sure. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's like, that's the other thing. Is like, I, I just don't expect much from him nowadays because I know that when it just comes down to it, it's like they're essentially just going to, uh, you know, they're, they're, they watched every kind of movie to where after a while, what is what is uh, the best of a uh, movie to watch? You know, because they, they're watching everything. They got no quality control. So um, after a while, uh, I, I really do feel like uh, I, I I like this whole overall arcing thing. Just the how it's a western mixed with uh, you know all this other crime and Fun horror blend. and action. It's not a scary movie, but it is a fun movie, and yeah. Um. We'll return after these messages. Hey, feeling down? Feeling low? Not enough podcasts about movies in your life? Why not try? They must be destroyed on sight! The new Podcast Cure All, sure to get you right with the world and on a path to better living. We have exploitation, we have Italian horror, we have zombies, we have slashers, we have crime films, we have spaghetti westerns, we even have sci-fi and sex comedies. So take a dose of... They must be destroyed on sight! As needed, and let the hosts, Lee Russell, Daniel Harper, Paul Romali, and the odd guest host, Cure What Ails Ya. Warning, may cause atrophy, African consumption, black fever, bone shave, chin puff, colic, cramp colic, Dropsy of the brain, elephantitis, grocer's itch, jaundice, mania, miasma, mortification, palsy, pox disease, rheumatism, scurvy, St. Anthony's fire, summer complaint, and worm fit in some people. Consult a physician before listening.
Hey, I heard you like movies. I heard you like to hustle. I heard you like podcasts. Well, guess what? There's a podcast for you out there called The Home Video Hustle. Damn right. Every Friday, we talk about whatever movie PJ picks out the bag. What does that mean? Every Wednesday on our YouTube page, I put a bunch of movies in a bag and PJ picks one out at random. Mm -hmm. And then we just watch it. We talk about it for maybe like an hour, hour and a half, two hours. Whatever we feel like doing, wherever the conversation leads us. But do we actually talk about the movie? Most of the time. Ah. Tangents galore. Yes. So believe me, we may be a movie podcast, but it's not always about movies. We might talk about video games. Mm -hmm. Music. music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. the big one, music. <laughs> uh, sometimes we might get a little bit of politicalness in there. Yes. Sometimes we may just, oh, we know what we like to do. We like to tell stories, PJ. Ah, yes. I am the master storyteller <laughs> yes. of the podcast realm. <laughs> Undefeated. So if you like to hear about movies, video games, whatever foolishness comes to our mind, the most random stuff you can think of, check out the Home Video Hustle. You can find us on the Stitchers, yes. the Google Play, yes. Apple Podcasts, what else? Podbean, what else? Podcast Addict, goddamn, all that. Ain't no reason you can't get your hustle on. We everywhere, worldwide, baby. Hustle, motherfucking hustle. Hey, we can't cuss in the promo, PJ. Ah, we gotta be family friendly. There may be podcasts out there that don't want us here to say, ah, 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 all that good fun <laughs> stuff. Well. <laughs> you. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't, don't run the listeners away, PJ. Ah, I'm sorry. But this is going kind of long. Yes. So we're we'll going to end this and say, hey, check out the Home Video Hustle every Friday on all the various podcast outlets. Peace. Peace. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. And while Witch didn't make it to the top of the world, he did make the Gangs of Hollywood podcast. So join the gang and enjoy a movie review podcast about movie gangs, gangsters, mobsters, and the mayhem they cause. You can find GOH Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at GOH Pod at www.gohpod.com as well as your favorite podcast listening app. And remember, say hello to your little friend for me. If you take two old punk rockers who are past their prime, put them in front of a movie screen and give them a podcast, what do you get? Cinema punks. Cinepunks. It's the mixtape of movies. Did you ever see a film at such a young age it left you traumatized with cinematic wounds? Oh, necrophilia. Oh, oh, oh. It's a dead issue, man. Don't, don't push it. Cinema PsyOps is a weekly podcast documenting an ongoing experiment on the mind of an unwilling test subject. No one should have to watch this movie. Oh, no one should have to watch this. No one should have to watch this movie. Surprisingly, it's not a topic that a lot of people really want to tackle. I'm shocked, crude. I know, really. Right? It's the next sexual frontier that no one wants to explore. I am, in the most sincerest of senses, disappointed in you. It takes a powerful goddess like Connie, jam her arm down the monster's throat and kill it. Oh, I'm still tripping out over that. Even as a kid, I was like, I gotta find a girl like that. Every week, I, I get a new look of disappointment that I never thought I could it's get out of it. unimaginable. At 12 years old, you should not be watching this movie. Obviously. At 13, you should not be. 14, you shouldn't be. I'm not entirely sure even 17-year-olds should be watching this movie. Just because you're offended by something doesn't mean that you have the right to demand that it doesn't exist. Watching this film again, I had all of this, like, little nerd glee with everything Dude, that kept Little history up. doll yeah, popping up absolutely. at you. So I totally loved this film. Hey, I know why you, you know, couldn't see that. It's because your brain's warped from watching this shit at 12 years old. Yeah, this is this is a rough movie. I told you ahead of time when we were getting ready to do it that it was How did you watch movie. this shit at 12? Because physical wounds heal, cinematic ones don't. Listen to Cinema Psyops. Hey everybody, I'm Corey. And I'm Zach. And we're the hosts of Podcasting After Dark, a cast dedicated to late night horror and sci-fi of the 80s and 90s, 
often found on HBO and Cinemax. You know, the movies your parents didn't want you watching as a kid. You can find us every other week on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, and Stitcher. This is what you want. This is what you get. It's time, let's check our cue, baby. Pair it with a couple brews, baby. We love good movies. We love the bad ones, too. So we watch them all and pass their lessons on to you. Oh, yeah. Everything I learn from movies Helps to make life a little bit groovy With a one last plot holes a gratuitous boobies It's time to get busy with your friend Stephen Izzy At eilfm.podbean.com Welcome to Who Was She Podcast. I am your host, Tara Jabari. After a decade working in documentaries, marketing, and all things digital media, I found that podcasting is a strong medium to share stories. After years of producing for others, I decided to start my own biographical podcast. Who Was She will focus on the life of a woman throughout Baha'i history. The first season is about Lydia Zeminoff. Lydia's story explores the subjects of the power of language and faith. Her father invented the universal language Esperanto, and she came from a Jewish family and became a Baha'i. She grew up during World War I and was killed during World War II in a concentration camp, despite heroic efforts to save her life. How can one person's life intersect with so many others, connect across borders, and inspire a biography which inspired this podcast. Over the next few weeks, I will share her story with you and the lives that were most affected by her and those who affected her life as well. They include her father, Ludwig Semenov, her spiritual mother, American journalist Martha Root, and the Baha'i German soldier Fritz Mako who worked for the resistance undercover while having to serve the Nazi party. I want to thank the author Wendy Heller and George Ronald Publishing for their blessing to let me use Heller's biography, Lydia, The Life of Lydia Zeminoff, Daughter of Esperanto, as a main and instrumental resource for this podcast. So please subscribe and learn about this amazing woman who traveled through three continents in an effort to bring unity through the power of language. You can also find more information on our Instagram, Facebook, and Pinterest at Who Was She Podcast. Music was composed and performed by Sam Red. I am your host, Tara Jabari. Join us next time as we begin our journey about Lydia Zeminoff. Hi, everybody. It's Mac Jackson. I wanted to invite you to a new site called the Forever Adventure Network. This website has everything. Pictures, videos, blogs. There's original music by Harmony Constant. Two podcasts. One is the MacGyver podcast, where we celebrate Richard Dean Anderson, his iconic roles, and how it's influenced our lives. There's episode discussions, interviews, and life conversations. The second podcast is the Never Gets Old podcast, where we celebrate all the best things that we love in life, from TV, movies, music, and comics. The site is also the home for the MacGyver SG-1 audio series, an ongoing adventure series that continues the adventures of MacGyver and SG-1. There are also multiple stores to choose from for all of your pop culture and adventure needs. Come on by and check us out today. And thanks for joining the adventure. Are you sick of the same old stale podcasts? 
Well then join Vanessa and Darren as they dissect movies of all kinds. The two lifelong cinema lovers bring their favorites, curiosities, and first-time watches to the operating table and inject them with a healthy dose of snark. Then there's the waiting room, where they examine books and short stories. So just look for them on Apple Podcasts and where fine podcasts are available. They're part of the Legion Podcast Network. Follow them on Twitter at VD Clinic Pod. Join them on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash VD Clinic Pod. Or email them at vdclinicpod at gmail.com. They're ready to cure what ails you. <laughs> and still, they just might be a little contagious. We now continue with our program. <sighs> Shit. Well, uh, did anyone ever see the TV show? I have not. <laughs> no. Me either. No, I've seen it. It's a mixed bag. No, thank you. Oh, good. It's a mixed bag. Um, there's a lot of good, and there's a lot of other people. Like uh, they didn't need an intro to Selma Hayek's character. The other gal playing her, just her acting, just wasn't quite there. She's beautiful, but that's about it. That's, no that's one so can do can quite replicate Selma. Yeah. No, no, she is one of a. Yeah, she is. Yeah, she's a gift. <laughs> um. I like the actors who they chose to play him. Uh, well, how the guy playing Richie is a better actor than Tarantino. Um, but um, yeah, uh, Jonathan and I have talked about the sequels before. Did you guys ever bother with those, or was it just not worth it? Uh, personally, I've never seen them. Yeah, okay. I did not. No, I have not gone there. No, it didn't feel worth it. Yeah, if, you're, if, it, if, yeah. Doesn't, if, if it doesn't have Tom Savini with a crotch machine gun, I don't want to see it. All right. Yeah, that's that. I like him as a Same. French artist, but I don't like him as an actor. So <laughs> I know a lot of people swear by this role as him. How do we feel as it, about him as an actor as a whole? Because I've seen him in some serious dog shit. <laughs> like you look at him in Night Riders with by George Romero, and his his acting is also pretty distracting in that. Not at first, I'm trying to. But... I'm just trying to picture what that looked like on the written page. The crotch machine gun. Like, how did they? Explain that in the in the actual written script. Okay, he's got this machine gun dick or star. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> and someone's like, "Yeah, good. Let's go with it." Yeah. Um, part two, I thought was fun. I understand if you don't like it. I, I just I, I liked Raymond Cruz, Muse Watson, a bunch of these other guys, and just the way they even introduced the deputies. Ironically, yeah, that is where uh, what's his name, James Park, is the son of Sheriff Mike Parks actually first appears in it. Uh, it even starts off with a movie within a movie segment with Bruce Campbell making a cameo. Um, it's true. It's directed by Scott Spiegel, who was Tarantino's mentor at, uh, what was it? Not Voltage Pictures, it was uh, Rolling Thunder, um, named after the exploitation movie the same name. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, uh Overall, uh, the CGI is still shit in it, but I, I just like how Robert Patrick kind of anchors it. And ironically, he ends up playing uh, Harvey Keitel's character, the priest in the reboot prequel TV show. So uh, uh, that one just had I not looked at who it was done by, I would have sworn that Tarantino was on set every day just imitating his usual style because there's, you know, Dick Dell, you know, old fiction playing. <laughs> Um, third one has Django Fett from Star Wars, and it's basically a prequel. Yeah. I don't recommend that one. Eh. I mean, a lot of people, them, so. a lot of people were totally saying, "Oh, you should check it out." I'm like, ah, "I think you're good. I don't recall much of anything to offer from that one." <laughs> yeah. Same, you know, you know, everyone starts somewhere, and they aren't always happy where they started. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably started there and wasn't happy with it. I remember. <laughs> yeah, hey, all good. I, I remember, what's his name, Tomorrow Morrison even said in an interview, like on his Facebook, he's like, oh, don't ever see Green Lantern, please, don't ever watch it. <laughs> it's been in more movies oh, than I've should. been in. Hey, yeah. Uh, 
So here's our challenge. Try and be in more movies than him, let alone Peter North. But I'm dumb. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> I couldn't resist. <laughs> uh, I, I just feel dirty. <laughs> because <laughs> because I know who Peter North because I know who Peter North is. Yeah, well. <laughs> I'd like to see him kill some vampires and Oh like boy. Oh god. <laughs> Please don't get him ideas. Oh, god. <laughs> oh. Yeah, they might actually do it. Left turn right. Clyde. Kill it. He'd be a bigger killer dick than Tom Savini. Oh my okay, god. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> And Tom Savini's crush gun. <laughs> those egg whites, man. Protein. Um, so. Oh. <laughs> okay, I'm done. I'm done. Sorry. But you so. so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Switching channels. Um, so. Uh, uh, so moving on to El Mariachi. How did we come across these? Did we watch them in order? Did we watch them? No, nah, take it back. None of us watched them in order. But um, no, I didn't. how did we? Uh, did we? Did uh, Daniel and uh, uh, David? Did you uh, rent these a lot, or just were they just on Showtime and the other movie channels? Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess El, Mar- El Mariachi. I must have rent uh, rented on probably on VHS. It was one of those ones I probably went back to after I watched From Dust Till Dawn, and I was like, well, let me watch what this guy's done previously. And, and actually, it's it's it's. Um, I liked it. I enjoyed it a lot. I, I really did. It was original. Certainly, you can't you can't take that away from it. Yeah, and it's wild how I do kind of consider it a Desperado, especially a semi Tarantino movie, because you know not only is he in it, it's yes, he gets blasted in the face, but um, uh, he even did some ad libbing and dialogue fixing throughout that whole scene, like especially the immortal. You know how many guys does it take to kill one man? It's just like damn. <laughs> okay. Um. I think it's even wild how not much material had to be cut. And uh, I think Salma Hayek said in an interview that it was a body double used. I don't believe that because they're in the same frame. So it's like, eh. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, it, it's just wild how this made, you know, Bandera's a bigger deal. And then, and then he starts getting action movie offers, you know, after doing Mambo Kings and Pedro Aldemotovar, you know art house and crime thrillers in you know spain so uh pretty mm-hmm. wild um and he's definitely one of the few people who even to this day he he did like this other movie it's like from germany or whatever which was kind of a oceans 11 now you see me type movie with magician thieves and he's clearly dubbing himself you know in his scene so it's like it's one of those he's always been a pretty cool guy just always dedicated and by this point, he's already, you know, gotten some awards and festival attention for being in Philadelphia as Tom Hanks' lover. So it's like he's quite a diverse dude. And uh, it's a shame that, you know, everyone knows him only from different things. And uh, but I think that's also the beauty at the same time, how, you know, uh, that he wasn't just a handsome face. He did have some just absolute just diversity. Uh, nature to him, and this one really kickstarted that whole American appeal. <laughs> I love the, uh, the the first Zorro movie that he's. I think that movie is fantastic. I don't know what. I don't, I'm not sure. If, he is really good. I th- I think that's a great movie. I think it gets a lot of uh, shit that it doesn't deserve. It, 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 it's there's a lot of cheesy dialogue, but like the cinematography, the music, especially like wow. And the, and the main villain, I can't think of the actor's name. The one who plays the you know uh, the Stuart general Wilson. custer. Yeah. Fant- yeah, fantastic, well fantastic um, antagonist, I thought. Yeah, yeah. I, I, even I knew it was a good movie, and I was watching on a really crappy VHS rental where the tracking was un- wasn't up to peak. And, <laughs> I mean, even though ben- even Anthony Hopkins is good in it, and he's clearly not yeah. you know, Spanish, but you know, <laughs> it's just one of those, it's just that rare Catherine Zeta, you know, this also made, started her fan base. So it's like, it... <laughs> I, yeah. I love that movie. That's one of those really guilty pleasures. It's actually not even a guilty pleasure. It's a, I don't it's think a, it's, it's a good action movie. Yeah, it's yeah, a good, guilty it's pleasure a, is that's, more. That's, uh, that's we, we, a treasured memory. Uh, yeah. On this show, we don't believe in guilty pleasures, but I know what you mean. Where it's like, um, I mean, it's not King Lear, but it's great. Well, and see, try and mm-hmm. here's the other thing: try and find someone who does actually like King Lear. You know, <laughs> ironically, there's a very futuristic 
well done version for Amazon Prime, also with Anthony Hopkins. But that's a story for another day. So I, I think <laughs> so at this time, Banderas, he's got those movies, these movies, you know, constantly performing business for Sony and then in Dimension. And then uh, he's, you know, he's also in the 13th Warrior, which I think is a great Michael Crichton book and very <laughs> underrated movie but it's not for everybody but um we're gonna see that one oh good um I, I love me some samurai style viking fighting but um yeah uh so you know he's a 90s powerhouse just in everything and uh you know uh this was always just one of those tbs would show it back to back with other nutty movies he had been in like assassins with stallone so it's just wild <laughs> yeah. how how he just becomes that kind of go-to guy. He's got to be something in some wacky thing. And, you know, years before he's doing just voiceovers for Shrek and all that, he's like, okay, yeah, he's, he is the, uh, if you need someone to play Canton Flaws, if you need someone to play, you know, some other. Because the studios knew that any guy wanting to take his girl to the movie, if he, she, if he were to say to her, well, you know, Antonio Banderas is in it. She'd be like, oh, okay, let's go. Right. <laughs> so it would, it would so it would move tickets. Exactly. He had that Ricardo Montalban almost voice oh, and just kind of laid back. Oh, yes. Syrupy thick. And it's just so funny. He's one of those if any comedian were do, to do an impression, they would instantly know who you're talking about. Just the crowd yeah. just goes wild. It's just that kind of rare thing. Guys want to be him, girls want his numbers. It's wild. And um so I, I think uh, third one, he kind of just fades into the background. And second one, you know, it's all kind of just more John Woo imitation, you know, seeing what you can do on an indie budget. But second one, you know, Desperado is the main one that everyone's seen. And it's wild how it's like, this one I really feel like he just lights up the screen. He is just game saying all the foul one-liners like it's, you know, no tomorrow. <laughs> it's second nature. Mm -hmm. um, just coming on in there saying, all right, motherfuckers. <laughs> you know, just... Um, uh, and he did all his stunts according to some trivia sites. That's that's some serious bruising. <laughs> you, you try bouncing around right. all these boots, jumping over the corners. God, I'd be fucking exhausted and then have to do the take multiple times. Ah, I'm not doing that. Shit. <laughs> uh, I'll run away from the fake explosion in the background. I'm not jumping over every counter, risking you know injuring my jawline, and, you know falling <laughs> on my head. No, I'm not doing that. But some people will. You never know. And it is wild how on most uh, posters and even DVD and Blu-ray cases, how it's just uh, the probably the coolest scene in the bunch, you know, post-coitus, where they're sh having their shootout and jump from the apartment. And just how the explosion of him and Selma walking in the background with the explosion in the back is just, mm -hmm. is like the most commonly seen like screenshot from that movie. <laughs> yeah, the, the slow explosion walk. Yeah, that was like every movie had that. Back. Yeah. Yep. yep. And uh, Danny Trejo was in this, probably his shortest character ever on screen, but it's wild how this was where Rodriguez did the family tree thing before that was really a internet thing and realized, oh, wow, Trejo's a distant cousin of mine. <laughs> and the guy I'm asking to throw a knife with barely any lines of dialogue at Banderas. Wow, he's related. Um, mm -hmm. Here's a theory. I've always seen the theory that uh, Mr. Pink from Reservoir Dogs, played by Steve Buscemi, you know, later either escaped the cops or jail and became a waiter in Pulp Fiction. Do you feel like he's the same character here in Desperado that he's in those two movies? <laughs> Under a different yeah. name. I do now. <laughs> yeah, now, wow. Oh, man, he's used as a total body shield here. He's like, wait, no. <laughs> uh, he's barely any scenes in the TV edit because it's such a foul mouth line. But yeah, you got it. That's why you got to watch the uncut version. However, it was one of those cut for TV versions I didn't mind compared to other ones where they would use, oh, darn, you know, it wasn't that, it wasn't that cheesy. Oh, uh, it wasn't that cheesy. Uh, it, most of the dialogue was just muted and you still got to see most of the awesome action. Lot, this definitely, this is also weird how Joaquim de Almeida, uh, who plays the legendary villain here, Bucho, it's wild how I can name other movies he's been in, like Beyond the Limit, Clear and Present Danger, even TV shows. And when I was on Queen of the South, only like one or two people knew who I what I meant when I said, hey, it's Bucho. I'm like, seriously? 
Come on. <laughs> One -oh. You've seen Desperado. You gotta know. At least call him by that character name out of all the other people. <laughs> and then instead they're calling him by the forgettable character name Epifanio on Queen. I'm like, seriously, he's barely even on that damn show, and he's a he's part of the main cast. Ugh. Ridiculous. <laughs> um Yeah. I, I this role kind of makes his career for the rest of the time because other than behind enemy lines. I see him, uh, you know, on a brief recurring role as a similar guy, spot, cartel guy, sponsoring terrorist activity on 24 and a few other movies and shows. And it's just so wild how it's like this pretty much typecast him for a while as the go to cartel gangster guy. Boot show. <laughs> and uh, this line is quoted by Mel Gibson, who's villain character in The Expendables 3, also with Banderas, with the whole how many guys does it take to kill one man? You know, it's, just, it's a great line. Uh, I'm surprised it was never used in any of the Lethal Weapon movies. Um, so, let, we can't not talk about the soundtrack. I suppose not. Yeah. Uh, it's actually, Bandera is actually singing that at the very opening. It's very cool. No lip singing or anything like they do with I'm Looking at You, Greatest Showman. Cool movie. Just saying. It's not you people singing it live and recording it on set. <laughs> Uh, I miss those days when the movie version was different from the recorded version. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm going to let you guys uh, carry it off. Uh, John, uh, what, what's your overview on just kind of how the action is staged and the other one-liners are delivered, just this whole Wild West uh, tribute? Well, for me, I just love like how over the top it is. But you get like the bar, the bar shootout. That's still my favorite of all three of these movies. Yeah, it gets in the mood. The music gets a little heavier. Dun, 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 dun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, um, Print, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's about the time of grunge metal coming into play. So there you go. Um, that's true. Uh, Dan Daniel, do you have any kind of pointers from this and just? Do you kind of consider this the weaker or the better of Rodriguez's filmography, or I consider the lesser. You know, just it, it. He's made such a niche for himself, but this one felt like he was trying to branch out and it didn't work. All good. Um, <laughs> I feel like the weaker moments are mainly in Once Upon a Time in Mexico. I don't notice it. On I the agree. Movie. It's just one yeah. of those you really don't care about anybody, but mm -hmm. Johnny Depp is so good at playing a villain, and yet. This is around the time that everyone's embracing digital. George Lucas had just done it with Attack of the Clones. Uh, what's his name? Uh, 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 Michael Mann embraces it like a year later with Collateral. But yeah, here Rodriguez just was like, hey, I'm filming it all digital. And I have to say, there's just some ugly shots, especially in the kitchen scene where he just kills the chef for no reason. It's like just the way the blood splatters. It just takes you out of it and gives it too much of a home movie look <laughs> I did the same thing after i watched it yesterday it was like wow. why is that there am i and I, I could never talk about tarantino or rodriguez in any of my film classes because my professors just fucking hated anything that had to do with homages or even star wars they were just not that kind of crowd and they liked all the pretentious art house kind of stuff <laughs> and all of us would just want to just you know, if we were the falling asleep kind, we would totally do that. It's like, yep, yeah, nothing to see here. I get it. I get it. He's trying to go straight. Uh, three hours and a little nothing next to nothing happening. <laughs> but uh, with this, um, it's an interesting cast, but he really doesn't make any use of the cast. I will say Danny Trejo is well used here. There's some cool music by Juno Reactor, who around the same time is doing music for the Matrix sequels, especially during the car chases ironically in both um but yeah uh the title the title protagonist he literally just fades in the background there's not much of him and then they kill off Salma Hayek's character and it's like I understand why oh, they do that but it's like just the way it's shot and everything is like why do we care oh why do you even have her on the cover she's only in the movie for like five minutes she was heavily featured in the trailer too and it's like I get that this sets up the whole thing but by the second portion of the movie you even forget that you know hey yeah that's right we're avenging her 
Mm-hmm. Um, Eva Mendes is interesting seeing her as a villain here, but I guess the main uh, niche is seeing William Defoe ham it up as a you know Mexican. <laughs> That's right. They were whitewashing back then, guys. Sorry. Um, uh, uh, Mickey Rourke is absolutely wasted here. It t- literally, each time oh, yeah. I see that this is on his IMDb, I'm always like, oh, that's right. That's Mickey Rourke about to be killed <laughs> by Danny Trejo while Defoe talks to him. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Uh, I'll let you guys weigh in, David. I, th- I, think, Danny, I think Danny Trejo, uh, after seeing Heat, Anything else that he's in when he's just playing this 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 cartoon characters, I just don't. He can actually yes. act and be an effective character in a movie that's well written. His character in Heat was one of the more fascinating characters in that movie, and I I hate to see him doing these where he's just a cartoon character, Mexican, you know, tough guy. Yeah, he it, it, he definitely is up there with Desperado co-star Bashimi where. I think he even said is like he does not turn anything down and you can't blame him. He's I remember him even giving a joke once on how he got attached to like do like one of those like Call of Duty type games, like one of the zombie mods. And is like, well, my my the story was my car broke down. My wife needed like a new fridge or something. So the phone rang and I accepted. <laughs> Actually, I don't. I don't criticize for that. I do the same it's fucking wild thing. How... But he's just. I think he's better than a, the vast majority of his work would indicate. I, I agree. I I can actually name fifty awesome movies, including stuff that no one's even seen. That's just very underseen indie films where he's not doing anything except playing the next door neighbor with some advice. I, I think he's very hysterical as the Native American chief in the parody movie uh, uh, Fanboys. <laughs> Totally worth watching. Basically, these guys uh, 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 go out to see the premiere of a Star Wars movie, <laughs> and they run into some resistance from everything, from cops to trackies to other stuff. It's it's funny <laughs> just seeing him in that movie. Uh, but yeah, uh, Con Air and a bunch of other stuff he's been in, and just this one he gets more to do. It's fun seeing him spar off, but then he dies really lamely. And it's just like okay, whatever. Um. So I guess this might be the biggest of the guilty pleasures. It's definitely one of the weaker ones, I guess. Uh, it's also stars future uh, cringeworthy uh, pop star Enrique Iglesias. So there you go. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will say they used almost every weapon on here, but after a while, it's just kind of background noise. It's just like, yeah, he didn't need to make this. At the same time, he was going to make it, and we eventually wanted to see more of Desperado at that time, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, no, I, I don't see myself coming back to this. I can watch, like, five seconds of it, because Depp is just stills every scene he's in, but it goes on way too long. So, um, yeah, that's mm-hmm. all I got. So I guess we'll uh, move on to the Machete franchise. They're making a third one of these. The character originally appeared in one of the Grindhouse uh, segments, and became such a fan favorite that you know they, they went and made this and i know a lot of people who were kind of disappointed by the first one but they still just shrugged it off because they were just so happy at the time this was the first time they'd seen you know prior to the badass trilogy of trejo just being the lead in his own movie i will say jessica alba is kind of cool in this but there's really not much to her in the other roles i get that it's campy and all i'm just saying that um mm-hmm. General thoughts on this, just how it's kind of a mix of just kind of commando, revenge movies, all that other stuff. <laughs> and how it sprang out of just a fake trailer. Uh, you know, your guess is as good as mine. Um, I know a lot of people say, oh, I'd see, you know, that was this was the first one. The second one was Hobo with a shotgun. That, <laughs> was <laughs> that but, but uh, we still haven't got Thanksgiving. Oh, my God. Thanks, killing. Jesus. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, there's definitely some moments, especially where he's threatening the guy with like some garden clippers. Um, I think these suffer just from Rodriguez literally just encountering the first random celebrity that he Googles and just casting him in the movie. That's what this feels like after a while, because I got to say, uh, they, they had to have had Trejo in mind the whole time. Well, no, no. I just mean all the other guys. 
Oh, but, yeah, that well, yeah. Yeah. Robert De Niro. No. I remember even showing this to some family. And they're like, why is De Niro in this? <laughs> Doesn't he pick better movies? And it's like, then in part two, it's like they have El Chameleon villain. And it train, changes from oh, yeah. Lady Gaga to Banderas to Cuba Gooding Jr. It's like, is this some joke I should know about? <laughs> and Walton Goggins even. I'm like, seriously? <laughs> um. I have to say, yeah, Gaga, I never heard. Oh, they are atrocious in part two. Oh, my God. Oh. atrocious, period. Yeah, I know. But so many people defend him. But it's just like, I, I've seen him on American Horror Story. I've seen Amber in other movies. I, I don't get the appeal. I don't even get the looks. I, yep. I do not understand. So no one can tell me why. So I'm just going to let you have it because I don't get it. Um. I will say the soundtrack, especially the scene where he's just randomly walking in the streets in part one, really catchy. If you just hear it by isolated by itself, and just that, it just you feel like someone's about to just go toro toro and just you know do some bullfighting. Um, I I do have to say, um, it's been. I guess I feel like there's more amusement with the commercials. And even just the merchandise, there's action figures of this damn thing than there is in the actual movies. Um, uh, like, basically, there was these ads for a while where Danny Trejo was doing for some, like, independent, like, mobile company. And he's like, machete, don't text or some shit like that. <laughs> it was actually kind of amusing, but um, I don't even know why he did it, because I don't think he was even really promoting the movie at that time. The movie was already kind of just... It was a big deal because Open Road Films, which, you know, had its home media distribution through Fox, was becoming a thing, along with Styx Media, just one of the few independent companies getting almost as many butts and seats as, you know, big scale studios like Universal and Disney. Um, uh, overall, uh, I feel like there's some moments. I just don't feel like it ever really delivers as much as from Dust Till Dawn or Desperado. This is where Rodriguez is just kind of he's not he's kind of getting some uh he's struggling to kind of be as relevant now that he's you know quit the director's guild and you know still be being beloved by indie filmmakers and collaborating on a few other films i would say if you're gonna see other movies that they've done uh or produced uh, i would recommend uh, uh what's this it'll come to me in just a minute um uh, there's this one cool movie called Hell Ride that I thought was actually a lot of fun and way more machete than machete, uh, where it's just a tribute to just stupid biker movies. But it just had Rodriguez's visual style and Tarantino's dialogue written all over it. So I, I thought that was a way better trashy fun movie than. Uh, and the other one that actually is this other fun serial killer movie produced by Tarantino's Rolling Thunder called Curdled. And once Tarantino and company acquired it, they then snuck in a cameo of the Gecko Brothers being shown on a TV screen from from Dust Till Dawn in one of the scenes. So now it's kind of part of the unofficially part of the Tarantino universe. <laughs> uh, so anyone got anything just kind of like on how like what Rodriguez is probably going to do next? Is he going to just keep doing homages for years to come or is he just kind of kind of lay low and keep doing all these Thanks for his cable channel, El Rey. I would say the what? channel, man. He's he's set for life. He he doesn't care anymore, I think. Well, I know he had one with Ben Affleck he was supposed to film. Really? Happened, yeah. Probably I remember some now it's about really about it, but... Yeah, because I, I know Ben Affleck is now doing the whole, you know, <laughs> I'm a director too, so now it's a matter of... It, there's definitely going to be some creative, uh, you know, uh, license issues uh, I'd like to see him just do something just slightly new like uh, would be nice because uh, uh, he's already kind of done Sin City but again he waited forever on that Sofia Vergara with tits that fire machine guns <laughs> should have been gold but it didn't really work for me and I know he's nope. been teasing machete in space but I'm just like uh, I, I miss the Rodriguez that kind of took a chance more on life kind of like Sam Raimi's initial thing before he be went back to being the franchise guy. Uh, I feel like 
they still got some power, but not enough. And, uh, I mean, maybe I wouldn't mind a spinoff with Jessica Alba or, uh, Michelle Rodriguez, no relations, uh, characters from Machete. That could probably work, but it would probably just be overkill and not work as well. I mean, if you got to see any early Rodriguez movie, I do recommend uh, Road Racers, which was originally part of Showtime's movie anthology series, Rebel Highway, because you definitely see a lot of his signature style there a bit. Um, but I think that's just it. I think after a while, he kind of got so used to just kind of like Roger Avery with Tarantino, just when they weren't using anything, then he was just used to just kind of just being the collaborator. And I'm sure he got a big head at some point, because how could you not? But uh, I don't know. I just feel like if he just really put pen and paper, I mean, he'd be better off if he just even worked with something else on with Frank Miller or something. I don't know. <laughs> mm. I think Frank Miller is kind of past his shelf date. Yeah, I guess so, too. I mean, it's not like he knows what uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't think I, I remember some forum saying that Frank Miller doesn't even know what uh, noir truly is. I, I believe that <laughs> because I mean they're not even doing typical noir things. They just seem to think that oh I'm narrating and it's in black and white. That's enough. Um, so I guess you could say we have kind of a love hate kind of like. Not so much like we have with Tarantino, where he's a bad person, but he's a cool filmmaker. Um, it's like Rodriguez, we're just kind of like, we just feel like he's kind of expiring on his shelf life, but yet we can still watch some of his movies any day of the week. So, the better ones. Um, <laughs> I can't remember if I scheduled Spy Kids, but I'm not going to make anyone else suffer through it. Um, uh, yeah. It's kind of even creepier how... You know, he's known Alexa Pin Vega, you know, since she was a kid. <laughs> and then he just has her be in all sexy wear for machete k- kills. I'm like, really, dude? Oh. She's practically your stepdaughter. <laughs> uh, some people uh, can't help themselves. Yeah, I think he's just. I remember hearing some casting couch rumor, but I can't find anything about it. So I would not be surprised if he's a little perverted and he needs to play by me too rules. I did kind of lose a little respect for him and Tarantino when I found that, you know, they had an idea of what Weinstein was capable of. I'm like, well, that's almost like being complicit. You know, <laughs> you got to put your hand up and say, I'm going to another studio. And then, you know, <laughs> just amazing how so many people feared that dude <laughs> back in the day. Fear does strange things. It is amazing how many people are like, just walk away. I'm like, no, <laughs> stand up. <laughs> Kick his ass in his office. No one's stopping you. Uh, Fight for your right to party. Wouldn't go that far. Oh. Oh, so I guess let's rank them. (laughs) I'll start with you, John. Uh And I'll go with Daniel and David. Um, So... Uh, how do you rank the From Dust Till Dawn franchise and then Mariachi and then Machete? <laughs> okay, so El Mariachi... Uh, on do... a five-star scale, yeah. <laughs> okay, I was making sure. Yeah, all good. All right, well, the original El Mariachi gave four stars. Woo! <laughs> Brado was five, because I've always loved that movie. Woo! <laughs> One Mexico... Is given one star, and I'm being generous there. <laughs> uh, from Dust to Dawn is five stars. That's easily my second favorite vampire movie. All good. Uh, from Dust to Dawn 2 is half a star because of our Patrick. That's it. All good. <laughs> from Dust to Dawn 3 is just one star. That's all I can say because I don't remember anything about it. Um, Machete. Machete, oh lord. Machete <laughs> gave like two stars. I thought I could say about that. Machete Kills is zero. Yeah, I'm about there. It should, 
it should have totally worked. It was a James Bond type parody and everything. Yeah. It just went Charlie Sheen as the president, and it just went on for. As Carlos Estevez, his real name. Right. And I went just really. To lit, and yeah. I don't think he legally changed it. I think he just played it up, saying credit. I know. Be funny. Yeah. Um, I I'm playing before. the president like my dad. I got a machine gun. See, it's mm-hmm. funny. <laughs> exactly. Um, all righty, Daniel, rank these suckers. <laughs> Oh boy. Um, well, Dust Till Dawn would definitely have to be his peak. You know, he was at his most creative and he had the best resources at the time. Uh, El Mariachi would be second because he was still very creative and original, but still struggling. You know, you got to start somewhere. Uh huh. Um, I would say Sin City comes next because there he had the resources, he had a vision, and he did something different with it. It's still pretty cheesy. Oh, good. I, I was actually going to save this for another episode, but I, I do feel like Sin City, uh, he embraces all the electronic music and the yeah. style over substance. But like you say, is like there are moments is like if it wasn't a comic book movie and so played up like that, you just wouldn't be able to accept it anyway, even as a movie. Yeah. So absolutely. Oh, uh, wait, they came back to life. Oh, OK. Um, Machete would be third just because, you know, I love B. Great Schlock and horror movies and exploitation movies like that. Mm. And uh, Spy Kids, Alita, and everything under that. Yeah, dead last. What are you trying to do? Oh, God. Oh, I, I could definitely not. I, I tried revisiting Spy Kids. It's just one of those. It's great as a kid, and it serves just that, but then it's like you get past mo- to movies two and three, and it's just like, all right, milking it. <laughs> uh, you know, one just harmless, even kind of funny seeing George Clooney be the president in that, but then it's like, yeah, part four, that's not a movie. <laughs> uh, and again, it's like, uh, Jessica Alba and all, even Joe McHeller in that is like, they should have just fired their agents after that. Um, so, uh, David, where do you rank these? <laughs> I think, well, it's hard for me to rank all of them because I haven't seen uh, other than the first ones in all of these series. But I think from Dust Till Dawn, uh, again, yeah, like we were saying, one of the best vampire movies I've ever seen. If you can survive the, you know, the neck whipping whiplash uh, of change of tone. I mean, there really are, it, it, there really are two different movies sort of stapled together. But, but I think it it's works if you can accept if you can just accept that um, yeah, going right. in. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed um, uh, El Mariachi. Um, it was, like I, said, I went back to it after I had discovered Rodriguez from, from Dustal Dawn, and I really enjoyed it. You know, I mean, where are you going to see a guy, you know, shooting a machine gun out of a guitar case? I don't know that that had been done before. Um, Sin City is fantastic. I really enjoy that. I think I enjoy that a lot more than a lot of people do. Um, yeah. And, um, but I, I oh and, and yeah machete I, I can't you know it's nice to see uh, Danny Trejo getting work because then he's not on the streets you know but I think the thing that we love about Danny Trejo is though he's he's like the American success story I mean he started out really really rough prison he's beloved by his, all the people he robbed yeah, yeah, from he turned so. his shit around and now he's this you know I would like to see him get more actual serious work but um, you know the dude's making more bank you than see I am him. so appear on just all the talk shows he's just lovely lovely yeah and, 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 and he started out so rough in life and that's what we and love you would never think, expect him to be on Howard Stern and we love those sort of stories about we looking. love those stories of redemption and mm-hmm. so, but I can't yeah machete I watched it I just like it was just it was just a chance to get Danny Trejo to watch Danny Trejo kill people which is fine but yeah I, and I haven't seen any of these sequels to any of them so I can't you comment know. on them from Dustal okay. Dawn's got to be my go-to I'm going to watch yeah, Danny Trejo in a Rodriguez film is going to be from Dust Till Dawn. All good. Um, and it is wild how he's just reinvented himself each time, depending on what filmmaker he's working with. He's done so many underrated movies like uh, Animal Factory, Runaway Train. Um, yeah, Runaway Train. I saw that. That's, that's, that's going way back. Yeah, that was his debut. He just gets punched in the face, and he and Tommy Tiny Lister don't have much dialogue. But, uh, uh, he is just one of those. It's just uh, he puts you literally at peace just watching him, and you just know that he's bigger than the movies he's in. He's even before he was having his real life stories. He's just 
has that aura about him nowadays, even in the movies where he just is in wasted cameos. You want to still just see him just the minute you see his name on the screen. Um, yeah, you're happy he, just to see him yeah, working. Yeah, you love to see him just getting some success. He was in this beyond garbage movie that's even worse than any of the lesser movies we talked about today called Acceleration. Basically, imagine a fun, what should have been a fun Fast and Furious John Wick style crime movie with Dolph Lundgren of all people. Imagine <laughs> Dolph Lundgren looking like he's passing both a kidney stone and having a heart attack at the same time, just delivering his dialogue very weird. And then imagine Danny Trejo being featured heavily on the poster. You see him in the movie. He's there for literally exactly a minute. Makes no difference in the plot narrative. It's like, why did why did anyone cast him to begin with? But um, getting back on track with these movies, uh, yeah, uh, I definitely rank uh, Desperado and uh, the first from Dust Till Dawn uh, up there with uh, uh, you know True Romance, Natural Born Killers, some of other Tarantino's arguably better works, um, and. I just feel like those cut the mustard. Those are just a fun, fun escapades that, you know, four out of five. Um, as for all the rest, uh, you know, I definitely got to <laughs> uh, give the Spy Kids uh, sequels and, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> a Machete and, uh, you know, even from Dust Till Dawn Free, just one out of five. They do not work at all. I like parts of... Uh, now, as for, uh, you know, Once Upon a Time in Mexico and El Mariachi, those kind of just vary on the day. Sometimes those are two, sometimes those are three. It's just... He's just not quite there in those ones compared to... But, I mean, El Mariachi should be seen by film schools people on just how to make a indie feature and... I mean, you're going to wa- end up watching Once Upon a Time in Mexico one way or the other anyway, just because your fan, it has a bunch of actors who you're fans of and you want to see everything they've done. But uh, I just love the Dick Dell soundtrack and From Dust Till Dawn too. But like we're saying, it's rough around the edges and there's some fun characters, but it does, uh, blur, it just blurs the line between just mindless exploitation and Tarantino tribute. So, um, and yeah, what can I say? Uh, I recommend the From Dust Till Dawn show, but it's still kind of a three out of five. It's it, it's got some messy episodes in between the interesting ones. Um, so, where can we find you guys on the web, uh, John? <laughs> on Twitter, I'm Action Fan Five Five Five, and on Instagram, you can see me as Jonathan Mark. Cool, cool. And uh, Daniel, Nightmare Nerd. <laughs> As always, the Nightmare Nerd on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. You can check me out. I write for uh, House Twitched Souls and Behind the Screams. Adrian can be scary and enjoy, folks. For sure, for sure. Okay, and David, what are you up to lately that you want to promote? Uh... I'm I, I'm on the uh, House That Screams podcast, um, and um, and here, and that's about it. I don't, you know, that's it. Okay. <laughs> and I'm and I'm proud to be here. Thank you so much. Anytime. And this was fun, kind of revisiting these in a way, just because of how, you know, some movies age, some movies you don't want to revisit because you're just afraid the nostalgia will have worn thin. It's just not as funny. It's just weird how we remember different things and. <laughs> Well, it was awesome at the time, and now I'm in denial on whether this movie is a piece of shit or not. Um, so, who knows what the future holds for Rodriguez, but it's interesting just kind of checking in on some of these movies and how they just... You cannot get a consistent uh, consensus with these movies. <laughs> I've already pre-ordered my tickets for Machete in Space. I'm ready. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to see it one way or the other, but I don't think I'll like it. Um <laughs> I wonder if they'll reanimate Mel Gibson in space. <laughs> be so awesome. He's fighting with a lightsaber. <laughs> oh my god! Oh, the Jews sent me here. They don't like me anymore. <laughs> oh. All right, that's all, folks. Thanks for joining in and listening. Have a good night. Good night, everybody. <laughs>
Follow us on the web on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The podcast is available on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, Apple, and anywhere else podcasts are available. Feel free to review our show and leave comments on any of those sites. Thanks a million for listening. It's a jacked up review show.